Welcome to Meet the Author, where you can join in on insightful conversations with best-selling and award-winning indie published authors. Your hosts today are Rob and Joan, who themselves are indie published authors, book publicists, and paranormal investigators with Tampa Bay Spirits, based in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thanks for dropping by. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Joan. We're so glad that you joined us today. Whether you're in our audience watching this live tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, or if you're listening to it later on on our podcast, or if you're watching the podcast uh, later on, we're really glad that you're in the audience. And as of December 7th, on Thursday night at 9 o'clock, this show will be rebroadcast on um, a radio station in Atlanta, Georgia, an FM radio station. So plenty of places to watch us. We have a lot of comments already. William Nelson. Hi, Bill Nelson here, new Hi, author Bill. and first time attended. Welcome to the audience, Welcome Bill. Aboard. We're glad to have you here. You beat George on tonight. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Joe Congel says, Hi, Robin Joan. Hello, Hi, Joe. Joe. We're glad that you're here. Marjorie Deering says, Wednesday again already. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Hey, yes. And Joy Shelton, your kind. Hi, Joy. Hi, Joy. And um, actually, that brings me to the next thing I wanted to say. We will be having um, a paranormal podcast. It's the last Thursday of the month, tomorrow night. And you guys, Jesse has some uh, real ghost stories that people have written into her. So she'll be telling one tomorrow night. She'll be reading one tomorrow night. And then we're going to talk about elementals. But also we're going to tell you about the May Stringer investigation that we did because you guys, we had crazy stuff happen that Very crazy. that we've never seen before. And I can't wait to tell you all about it because some of it is really bizarre. Really, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time and we were like, wait, what? That'll be tomorrow night on Haunted Campfire Tales podcast, uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, basically where you're watching right now yep. for the most part, or you can go over to the Tampa Bay Spirits uh, Facebook page. Uh, and watch there. And you can catch up on all the old episodes at Tampa Bay Spirits 1, number one, at uh, dot com on our website there. Um, Joe Conchel says, congrats on the Atlanta station. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Any word on the British magazine? No, we haven't talked to them about, um, they want us to do, a, yeah, they want to interview us and do an article about us in their magazine. And we'll be doing that soon. I really would like to wait until after the holidays because we've been super busy. That would be the best. And George Dismuke says, okay, so like I'm here, dogs at my feet, a wedge of Nadine's birthday cake at my elbow. Happy birthday, Nadine. It wasn't today. It was yesterday. That's German chocolate cake. Thanks, George. With pecans. And George's leg is propped up. <laughs> good to know. That's good news. Uh, <laughs> he was bitten by a spider and it's very bad. It sat down beside, no. Uh, episode Rewind. This coming Saturday is episode 107. Uh, Maureen Dixon, uh, Pilots of the Caribbean, not pirates, Pilots of the Caribbean. And uh, that's at 5 30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time, right where you're watching this. That was um, an amazing show. Was, Remember, you guys? Amazing, yeah. Uh, uh, UK. Yeah, and she she's spoke UK, about uh, that. Author. Mm -hmm. She spoke about that gentleman that I, made me cry. It was, yeah. He was so amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be live again, and we'll have uh, author Mike Clifton on uh, again. He was on last year, I think. We like Mike. He and, has a new book uh, coming out. He's another Texan. Um, and let's see what else we have. Oh, uh, the Magnolia Bluff Crime Chronicles uh, full book ser series tour is well underway now. Uh, they had uh, stop number two uh, today, mm -hmm. and uh, I think there was a stop number three. I think uh, it was three. It was three Joe's today. Joe's in the key. That's right, Monday, audience. Tuesday, and Wednesday, so, it was so stop it's three. three. Um, and it's going on until December 8th. Um, you can go to Lone Star Literary dot com um, and then you click on the blog tours tab um, if you're having trouble finding it just email us and we'll be happy to help you find that uh, there's a giveaway um, 
uh, bundles of uh, books, uh, series books, and uh, even a, uh, Am uh, I think it's a, a gift card. A gift card. An yeah. Amazon gift card for $25. Yeah, yeah. Now, another thing that y'all might be interested in, we're going to go, this is the news. Okay. Uh, the top eight audio downloads oh. for the last 30 days, these countries, okay? Number eight, running in, uh, just barely making it into the eighth slot is Saudi Arabia. Seven is the Netherlands. Eight is Canada. Come on, Canada. Come on there. And, <laughs> you uh, can be more than number seven <laughs> or number six. Eight, seven, six. six. Five is India. Bangladesh is four. They're Bangladesh. always, they're oh, always in the top five. Russia has slipped down into the third spot. And the UK is number two now. They moved up. Probably because the of that spot. article. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And uh, but US, of course, is number, number one. one. We, we're carrying sixty-five percent. So there's a lot of people in the other parts of the world that are watching uh, this show, and we thank you for tuning in. So Joe Conjol said, "How was the camping trip? It was wonderful. It was really, really fun. It rained every day." Yeah, but it was really nice. We got a lot of riding. It was a riding down. trip, so that made sense. <laughs> yeah, and and then Joe saw Conjol said, and we wind up the tour. We do wind I, up the tour. Yeah. We're, we're, we're in the, the caboose. caboose. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married a long time. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so what so, else would you like to talk about? Uh, how about we talk about our author that's going to be on tonight? She is a New York Times bestseller. Paul Hollis says Hi, Paul. hello, Walt. Robert White, Ooh, yes, and here's another part of the world watching Australia. from Australia. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for tuning in. I hope yeah, you're doing well today, Robert. Mm -hmm. I do too, Robert. We think of you often. Think you good thoughts. Introduce. Yes, uh, I would Patricia? like to actually introduce the author, New York Times bestseller Patricia Crisipuli, and I think you're going to really enjoy what she has to say and share with us. So. And if she hasn't gone home, Let's we're going to bring, bring her, her on, on. Right now before she does go home. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Hi, Patricia. Hi. Patricia. All right. Well, luckily, I am already am home, so I could just listen oh. and be home. So it was <laughs> okay. Not one one more comment. Paul Hollis says, hello, all. Hi, Paul. We're glad that you're here. There we go. Okay. That's it for comments for now. All right. All right. So how Patricia. are you doing, Patricia? I'm doing great. Uh, it's so very atmospheric. I'm in Oregon, as we talked earlier, and it's getting very dark and foggy, and it's a perfect atmospheric condition. I wish I could turn my computer around, but last time I did that, it went off. So we're not doing that. Yeah, we we, uh, we, we remember that. Yes. Yeah, it's like, it is like, it is becoming a dark and stormy night. <laughs> so if you're talking Good about for mystery. A mystery or exactly. for a paranormal thing to happen. Exactly. Or... So I feel like it's a, uh, and the trees are getting really dark. Be anyway. good for a now, true this, crime, right? We've got another comment no, from no. Robert White. He said he's doing well down here aside from the heat because it's good summer there. And, it, of course, we're be at the beginning of almost the beginning of winter. Not quite there yet. but Yeah, we were in the 40s overnight. That was brutal. Whew. Very brutal for Tampa Bay, Florida. You yeah. know? For us, it was. I know for other people in other parts of the United States, they're like, oh, that's, you know. That's springtime. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, take off my jacket. It's 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should see me going out. <laughs> Thermal shirt and a sweatshirt and a jacket well, and a hat and gloves. I don't, I don't normally wear long sleeves and I'm wearing long sleeves right now. Robert White said, dark and stormy in Oregon is a normal state for the place, isn't it? Exactly right, Robert, especially this time of year. And I'm one of those weirdos that, I mean, I love my summer. I'm a runner. I go outside a lot. But this time of year when the days are short and it is sort of dark and kind of insular and kind of like a cocoon, I love it. I am very much not the majority in my family who just look at me and go, what? <laughs> <laughs> Joe Conjol said, my wife, my son and his wife were in Portland, Oregon, right before the holiday. They hit a lot of microbreweries with great pizza. <laughs> Sounds I like Portland. Like Portland. It's fun. Yeah, Portland's great. Has a good zoo. Okay, so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about 
we know you had a writing career before you started writing fiction. You had a nonfiction writing career, maybe tell. And a, and a, and a journalism know. one before that. So um, the, the timeline begins very early. Truly, I was seven when I decided that I wanted to be a writer. Um, I, I always sort of told myself stories in my head as a very young child to keep myself, you know, entertained. And at seven, I picked up a pencil and a piece of paper and sat down at my dad's desk and I wrote down, you know, four whole sentences and there is a story. No, it, it, something was kind of lost in the translation from brain to paper, but I was hooked. And um, I knew I always wanted to write. So, you know, through school, it was something I was good at. And I was a, uh, an intern at 16 at the local newspaper and went to college and was a, 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 a cub reporter. And journalism was my way in because I couldn't figure out any other way to write for a living. Um, and um, in, indeed, you know, my, my path just seemed to be um, I mean, it wasn't exactly like wide open and easy, but but in my heart, I knew that was what I was supposed to do. I love stories. I think stories are a gift we give ourselves and other people. So from the journalist and business journalist, it was natural for me to write nonfiction, even books in leadership. My New York Times bestseller is actually a leadership book from the financial crisis. But, you know, it it was um, my, my, uh, my, my big, my, you know, my big breakthrough, but I always wanted to do fiction and to use the same kind of research skills and storytelling, um, story development, narrative skills that quite frankly, go across all genres. Right. And at the age of 52, I went back to Northwestern university for a five-year program, working during the day and go to school at night to get a master's in fine arts and in creative writing. And um, that's because I wanted to get my craft as good as I could. Um, and that creative thesis became my first novel. With All right. a, yeah. So that's kind of the, the whole arc. Um, and that was my path. And, you know, I encourage everyone writing is writing, whatever you're writing, it's it's all good and it's all it all works. And we follow the narrative of the stories we want to tell and the narrative of our own lives and, you know, see where it takes you. That's was where it that me. Onita Harbour that you're talking about? Yes, that was the first. And that oh, was. Am I pronouncing was, that correctly? The secret. I of, call it Onita Harbour. I mean, it's a I fictional said. place. Um right? It's based on my hometown. It's no secret because I put it in the author note. It's based on <laughs> big shout out to Oswego, New York, uh, where I was actually last weekend uh, launching book two. But yes, that was the first. And um, anyway, I, I, uh, I use upstate New York as my setting. It's one I know well because I grew up there. I also have the distance from it because I live on the other side of the country. But what makes it so interesting there is the topography is beautiful, the Adirondack Mountains, the Great Lakes, you know, Lake Ontario, the Finger Lakes, which are glacial and go down hundreds and hundreds of feet, and the history. Every major, you know, a formative event in, uh, uh, in the history of this country, there's a link in upstate New York. Um, old forts and old post cemeteries and Napoleon's brother lived 70 miles from where I grew up. And um, the War of 1812 battles on the Lake Ontario, the, the, the revolution. So with all this history, mystery, topography, it was a rich setting for me to say, this is where my mystery should be based. That's wonderful. And your next book is called Stillwater's Chasm. And that's in right. you're using your same characters in this book. Same character, same setting. Um, it's, you know, Stillwater's Chasm. You won't find it on the map in New York State. But if you, um, let's see, go out to what I call Salmon River Reservoir and you move a finger lake in there and you put up the walls of our Sable Chasm, you'll have the fictionalized version <laughs> of a real place. But yes, it's all set there. It's same characters. I wrote it as a standalone um, mm -hmm. because I don't like it when a clip at the end of the book, it says, and the door opened and there was Fred. You know, I, I want to have completion and then a next book. And so I did that. So you could pick up book two and it would be fine. Um, yep. But if you read the series, 
it, there'll be a little more you know, character development, story development. Exactly. Exactly. The same with our books, but you're going to develop your characters more with each book that you write. So, right. so it helps to read the whole series. <laughs> but we but always like you it. write them as standalone so that people can see have a whole story without being lost. Right, and I did. I've done that with series too. I with Louise Penny's books, I read them completely out of order. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I just happened to be like, oh, this looks interesting. Oh, it's right, oh. right. And I was in the middle of the series and I read back and forth and she's so skilled. And, and I, I think it's something to um, to take into consideration that people might be visiting <laughs> in the middle uh, and give them a satisfying story. Yeah, I agree completely. Can you tell us a little bit about your publishing journey? Yes. OK, so. Um, you know, from the nonfiction, right? Um, you know, I was published by smaller publishers and business publishers. You know, I've been published by Paul Grave McMillan on a book about Rwanda, Wiley, and um, in um, the leadership book. Um, my very first book was actually HCI, which is um, the folks who published the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. So that they oh, did yes. my very first yes. nonfiction book. And on, on this uh, and when I got into fiction, I my my lovely agent Delia, hello Delia, um, mm -hmm. said to me, you know, I love because your books are a bit literary, and you've got a mystery within a mystery because there's always an artifact. You know, I'm going to recommend you know you to this um, indie publisher called Woodhall Press because I know that they're expanding and they and they're looking for unusual storytelling, and so. You know, I was like, yes, I, you know, I love them. Um, they've like their cover work is gorgeous. Um, and they really take care with the with this with the with the story. And I, I it's been a very good match. You know, um, I've often said, yeah, that's much better to look at the, oh, the cover than when me mm -hmm. held mine up. I always say that, you know, you go, it's like. It's like being asked to uh, out on a date. You go with the one that's who asks in and you decide, yeah, say yes. But it is that it is that partnership. I, I think that's been the number one thing. I've been really lucky with publishers. Um, it's hard to get them. It's hard to get them pay attention and all that stuff. But when I forge that relationship with an editor, um, it has been I've saw I've sought it as partnership, making sure that I'm bringing my A game, but I'm doing my marketing and I'm doing my promotion and that we, we're working toward mutual goals. Yeah. Good. That now, sounds good. Do they do much marketing for you? I mean, more social uh, stuff, you know, they, they've got a good platform. I think it behooves every author to do as much as you can um, because I'm a communications consultant in my day job. I, I know a little bit about marketing. And of course, you know, I write all day long anyway uh, for clients. So um, and I work with a, a wonderful publicist, publicist, Avita. A uh, little hi to Avita, uh, who is um, helping me to, re I mean, doing great work about getting the word out. So, you know, it's all those things. It used to be in nonfiction. When you wrote a nonfiction book, they'd say, well, what's your platform? Because if you wrote a book about, oh, you're an, you know, in a, um, a, a physical fitness expert and you were like, you know, I trained the Navy SEALs and being physically fit. They'd say, well, what are you doing? You're like, well, I go to the Navy SEAL conference every year and I do this. And they want to know your platform. They also want that now in fiction. They want to know, can you reach people? Oh, can absolutely. You, and, and I know it feels like, ooh, because every writer I know, myself included, is like, no, I want to write. I want to market. But we have to occupy both of those worlds. And the way that I have wrapped my head around it is to say, it isn't ego. It isn't, oh, look at me. It isn't, I'm a steward of my book. I love my stories. I love my characters. Mm -hmm. I owe it to my characters, to this creation, to give them um, a launch into the world. So if I see it as stewardship, of something I've created, yes, but that was created maybe through me, and that these this story will bring someone joy or entertainment or um, give them some uh, an opportunity for a little critical thinking, which is what mysteries do. They exercise our brains. Then as stewardship, marketing becomes less onerous and more like 
helping something you love get into the world? Perfect. I think it's the hardest part for, mm -hmm. for authors because, um, you know, first of all, we've been taught not to toot our own horn, you know, yes. since we were yes. children. And really, it's something that you have to do. You, I mean, you don't want to say, well, you know, you might like it. I don't know. You might not. No, you can't say that. <laughs> No, and right. you can't just say, well, well, people will find it, especially in no, a very they won't. category. Because they won't. Uh, yeah. Everybody and their brother. And and we've got, you know, it's a, it's a very, very crowded category. So we have to do what we can to, two things. Number one, to... Um, to push, you know, and, and get the message out and to, um, to help each other. And I mean, how gracious is this podcast that you Thanks. do this? Oh. Because, you know, you could just be talking about your own projects, but you invite people like me on here. And it's a very, I'm going to use the word, it's a very loving thing to do. So thank you. Well, thank you're you. welcome. And right now we have to let some other people... <laughs> promote their promote books. their books so we're going to take a little <laughs> and little break so it's a good segue there i just want to say i see your comments and we'll we'll get to them as soon right. as we come back from these right so short words from our sponsors hang on we'll be right back yes. don't go away guys don't go away More to come. it's every parent's worst nightmare police officer madison jackson awakes to discover her baby kidnapped from her crib was it revenge for someone she arrested or something far more sinister? Madison's estranged husband is incarcerated in Supermax. As the second in command of a deadly Mexican cartel, did he issue the order to abduct their daughter? Bye Baby Bye from author Kelly Marshall. Get your copy today. An unforgettable mystery thriller that will transport you back to 17th century England. Introducing Dream of Courage, facing fear head on, your passport to 17th century mystery, mayhem, and murder. Follow Robert and John Rushworth through Leeds' bustling Brigade District, where danger lurks in the shadows, embodied by the thief taker Jacob Wilding. You will laugh, you will cry, and be in awe of the twists and turns. It's meticulous attention to character development, emotional nuance, and the unfolding of the story's layers. Promise a compelling and emotionally charged journey. The U.S. National Times said, Modern writers usually don't know what it was like to live in the past. But Rushworth Brown does this with great skill. Uncover the secrets of Smythe, the enigmatic tavern keeper who sends Robert to the Haven. To the pirate Captain Girlington. Will he outweigh danger in the nick of time? Paradise, my prison. Charlie Flint awakens from a deep sleep and finds himself alone on a tropical beach surrounded by a palm tree jungle and exotic animals. He cannot remember who he is or anything about his life. First, he must find food and build shelter and protect himself from hidden dangers. As his memory gradually returns, it reveals what a very flawed person he is. A man who made too many mistakes, made too many enemies, the implications of the truth are staggering. How did Charlie get there? And will he save himself? Paradise My Prison is the riveting new suspense thriller from retired Hollywood scriptwriter George Dismukes. Paradise My Prison by George Dismukes is available in jacketed hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats worldwide. And we're back. And Robert White just wanted to say that he was in Oregon from November of 2005 until May of 2007 in Aussie in Portland, Oregon, Portland or somewhere in Oregon. I'm not sure exactly where. Uh, Joe Conjol has a question. <clears throat> he says, hi, Tricia, just curious. What are your thoughts on AI and its possible effect on the writing industry? Oh, that's the question that everybody's asking. And in all mm -hmm. facets of my world and my communications consulting world, people say to me, well, do you think that, you know, chat GPT will put you out of business as a communications consultant? And and or, you know, will we get, you know, and, you know, all our novels and all our scripts being, you know, regurgitated by a really smart bot? And, you know, I think it'll be a tool. I think it's already being used as a tool. 
and maybe I'm uh, delusional or I'm not facing the reality, but I can't imagine that we as writers are going to be totally replaced. We think about, you know, how much we use our memories, our senses. So while a bot may be very good, and I've seen it for, you know, giving um, a cursory marketing copy for someone, I just can't imagine that the entire creative process and using a, a thread of memory and a hint of this is going to be replicated by a bot. So that's the story I'm telling myself that we are not obsolete, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, this uh, it, it's probably going to change. But I also remember when people were concerned about ebooks and would it put publishing out of business. You know, technology is here to stay. And I think we will, our imaginations, our creativity, our humanness will always be valued because it's what we do uniquely as individuals. And that brings us to audiobooks. Audiobooks are really, I think, outselling ebooks and paperback or paper hardcover. And I'm one of those consumers. I love my Audible because I'm a runner and I put on my earphones yes. and I, I want to listen. And I've been listening to, oh, here's a goldie oldie. Tim Curry reads A Christmas Carol, right? Oh, and my gosh. Oh my gosh. Perfect. First of all, like 18 hours long, which is great when you're a long distance runner. You get, you know, a week's worth of. But I also buy, you know, hardcover books and soft cover books yeah. and ebooks because I think the the content and i know that's a word but let's call it what it is it's creative content is going to find people in different ways and it'll be consumed in different ways i think i i'm hopeful i'm optimistic that it makes our stories more relevant to more people and consumed and in more ways than fewer ways so i'm actually pretty hopeful about that yeah i don't think we have to worry about mm. ai to tell you the truth but no. that's just me um, so Joy Shelton York says, how do you feel about AI Audible? Well, I can't uh, really speak to AI Audible. Um, uh, so I'm not quite sure if that's a, a, a non-human voice that's doing the reading. It would or... be like Siri doing the reading. Yeah. Oh, can you imagine? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not so good. I don't know. I, I use the uh, read aloud for proofreading. You know, you can put it. Yes, on yes, yes. Yes. And right, sometimes right. it has kind of interesting pronouns. a Sean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you're kind of like, huh? like what? Did I write that what? like that? <laughs> it, it read the word content for me last night is content. The marketing content will be delivered <laughs> by the reporter. Yeah. Like, well, that's the way really it is right content. now. Right, anyway. Right. Joe Conchal says, even with audiobooks, I think Amazon is going to offer a computer-generated reader for those. <gasps> oh, I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I love the people who do the voiceovers and the people who read the audiobook. I love Oh my gosh, some of them are so, so talented. I mean, and and I think the consumers will, I mean, um, Ann Patchett's Tom Lake is written, excuse me, is read by Meryl Streep and no chatbot's going to ever do that. Right? Joy Shelton York said it is being offered already. Okay. okay. That's too bad, Joy. Well, I don't... it makes books accessible, that would be wonderful, right? For people who have perhaps a visual impairment, if it makes it accessible, but again, I'm hopeful that will it'll help content and stories become more. You're, you're right. We had an author on who was blind from life, uh, from birth for all of her life. Yeah. And yes. she told us, and this wasn't on the air, it was after um this was after after we or before the show, she said that she couldn't afford a lot of braille books. Uh they're very, very expensive. And so for her, it's a wonderful thing to be able to have things on audio books. And uh, Joe Conjol said, AI can't replace a pantser, LOL. Okay, so are you going to ask or are you going to make us ask? Go ahead and ask. Okay, <laughs> usually Joe asks this. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Um, hmm. You know, you an outline or do you, you like know, to I, 
I, I like to say that I do an outline and I'm, I'm doing one of these because I'm trying, I, I, I kind of changed my, 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 my uh, way of doing this from book two to book three, the one I'm working on now, I, where I did more of an outline and I liked it because it gave me guardrails and it was a time when I had a lot of distraction in my life, but I'm one of those people. I like to dive in and just start writing. And then in the middle say, okay, what the heck do I have here? Yeah, where am I? I truly believe, uh, <laughs> you <we> know, <laughs> art is in the rewrite. And then I sometimes do what I call a reverse. I'm going to be give you a crazy answer, a reverse outline. Okay. In the first 180 pages I've written, I, this and this and this and this. And I see that. Maybe that should move. So I, I do this kind of free flow then do an inventory, kind of fit it into a, a, a retrofit it to an outline and then maybe see where it goes. But I'm one of those people that I, I like to listen to my characters. I like to be surprised, but I usually know the end scene. I'm very, it's very unusual for me to be surprised in my end scene, but it did happen in book two um, where suddenly. That's I, awesome. Hmm? I said, that's awesome. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. I was very surprised. Actually, it happened also in book one when a character said something, and I don't want to spoil it. He said, no, you know, I thought it was all going one way, and then a character said, well, can we really do this? And I'm like, stop talking. Stop saying that. And then I realized that, you know, unconsciously I had developed that, and I, I yeah. went for it, and it became a much more satisfying ending. So we added a third style here. You realize that. Yeah, I guess why reverse, I was like. Hey. Reverse plotter. <laughs> reverse plotter, you know, I'm a, you know, plotter, a a reverse plotter. Reverse plotter. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and George Dismuke says, and then there are old school barnacles like me. You ain't ever going to use AI. No, I, I don't, don't want to listen to AI either. No. George said, Trisha, do your characters come to life of the pages for you? She just answered that oh, without I, before you were asked. Ways, George. I mean, I dream about them sometimes. I actually dream the name of one of my characters, Daniel Red Deer. I, I was trying to come up with this was years ago when I was, you know, in the early stages of what became the thesis and all that stuff. And I was like, I need a character name and whatever. And I, I fell asleep. And in this dream, this man stands in, you know, in dark background and he has hair pulled back, gray hair, and he says, my name is Daniel Red Deer. My name is Daniel Red Deer. My name is Daniel Red Deer. And I woke up and I was like, so that, almost like Sheldon on the Big Bang, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what that means about me. You know? Yeah. But like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go with it. Uh, and so my characters do come alive. They do, they do surprising things. A bad guy turns out that he wanted a redemption. Let's see who else. Two characters fell in love that I didn't see that coming. And I was like, oh, man, I got to go rewrite a bunch of stuff. Um, so, yes, they always surprise me. George Dismuke says, one of my characters keeps getting in the fridge and drinking all of my beer, to which Robert <laughs> White said, at least they aren't taking the chips and cookies. There you go. <laughs> or the car, right? Yeah, that, that, that. <laughs> well, that would be bad. <laughs> Um, when do you want to have Patricia read? Um, we should probably do that very soon because yeah. we're going to have a second break coming up. Yeah, let's soon. do so that. Why don't we do Are that you good right with now, that now? If, if you're ready to read? You I'm betcha. sorry if I keep calling you Patricia, but our daughter is Patricia. Everybody else calls us her Trish. <laughs> and, and my I sister calls me Trisha. Patricia. So uh, you're in good and you're in good. Anything. It's all good. It, and it is my author name, Patricia, and um, <laughs> Trisha, and it's all good. Okay, so this So is... I'm going to read you a little bit from The Secrets of Stillwater's Chasm, which is book two, and the Onita Harbor Mystery Series. So the setup, real quick, is my protagonist, Gabriella Dominici, is out on a lovely hike in the beautiful foothills of the Adirondack Mountains with Daniel Red Deer. Um, and they are very much having a romantic day and it's beautiful there. But of course, as you can imagine, since this is a murder mystery, things are gonna get kind of interesting. The September sun rose above the trees and stood nearly at its apex. Gabriella paused to retrieve her water bottle from her backpack and took four long swallows. 
She offered it to Daniel, who drank deeply. When they'd had their fill, she replaced the bottle and reached for his hand to continue walking. She recited what she'd read the night before about this part of northern New York State, how during the most recent ice age, great glaciers had carved deep lakes and chasms and piled debris and earth into tall foothills. Just 30 miles from where they hiked rose the Adirondack Mountains, which contained some of the oldest rocks in the United States, more than one billion years old. Who knows? Maybe some of these stones too, she said, kicking one with the toe of her hiking boot shoes. Always the librarian, Daniel replied. Gabriella caught the deepening smile lines around his eyes. Guilty, but I like knowing stuff. And I like hearing it. The trail curved to the right, the trees parted, and Gabriella gasped at the first glimpse of the rocky walls of Stillwater's chasm. Taking slow steps toward the edge, Gabriella peered over, expecting a sheer drop off. Instead, the chasm walls sloped downward to the long, thin Stillwater's Lake, nearly a hundred feet below. On the other side, rocks lay in horizontal bands like the layers of a cake except where they heaved up, in some places nearly vertically. Gabriella scanned the rugged land stretching in all directions. Not one human-made structure could be seen. I see why you love it here. Daniel came up beside her and placed his hand gently on her back. It's one of my favorite places. They followed the curve of the lake, skirting a small marsh studded with cattails, up ahead, the bleached hull of a tree trunk rested on the shoreline, and beside it was an upturned canoe, its deep green finish glistening in the sun. Gabriella looked behind them, wondering if they should walk in the other direction to preserve the illusion of being the only people here. But Daniel continued forward. On the other side of the tree trunk, hidden from sight until they reached the canoe, a man stretched out face up on the rocks. For an instant, Gabriella recalled Daniel reclining on the ground and wondered if this man might be sleeping. Then a faint gurgling noise grabbed her full attention. She dropped her backpack and rushed over to him. He looked to be about 30, dressed in jeans and a plaid shirt with a gray quilted vest. His body trembled stiffly, his arms and legs rigid against the stones along the shoreline. Help me roll him on his side, she ordered. Daniel grabbed the man by the shoulders, lifted him away from a puddle of vomit around his head. The man's body shuddered, then went limp. Gabriella began to detach as if floating above the scene and watching herself attending to the man while Daniel waved his cell phone in the air and complained about getting a signal. Focus, she commanded herself and recalled the first aid training she had received years ago and the refresher course she took periodically. Pressing her fingers into the man's neck, she felt for a pulse, nothing, or perhaps just very faint. Her vision dimmed, narrowing to a tunnel. To stop at Gabriella swept her gaze over the water, across the beach and the woods behind them. She saw another person lying there on the ground where the stony shoreline met the trees. Her consciousness slammed back into her body and Gabriella took off, stumbling over rocks to reach a woman. At the sight of the gray face and half-opened eyes, Gabriella's perception blurred again and she shook her head vigorously to clear her brain. Vomit, she noticed, rimmed the woman's mouth and streaked her neatly plaited brown hair. She took note of the woman's jeans and red quilted vest over a long sleeve t-shirt. Gabriella tried to detect a pulse but felt only cold flesh. The woman had been dead long enough for her body to cool. Turning back toward the beach, she saw Daniel splashing the man's face with water. Come on, wake up, he yelled, piercing the swill of, swill, sorry, piercing the swirl of fear. One thought whipped Gabriella into action. She had to save this man. Rushing over, she knelt beside his body and began rapid chest compressions to a count of 30 then breathed twice into his mouth. Go get help, she told Daniel between breaths. I'm not leaving you here, he said, and I'm not leaving him. 
then we're both staying. Wow. That was wonderful. That was very, very good. So we what have going on in that yeah. town, okay. <laughs> you know, a, a lovely hike. Suddenly there are two bodies, uh, one person dead, one person dying, a little tiny surprise. They go up the trail to get help. And when they come back, nobody's mm. wow. <laughs> so no, do you believe your, no. do you believe your senses? Do you believe what you saw? Do you believe, thank you, wonderful reading. That's very kind. Yeah, um, do you believe what you see, what you believe? And Gabriella finds herself in this place. And all of my mysteries have this modern day, you know, whodunit. And underneath is always an artifact because she's an authenticator. So she busies herself with other things to distract herself from what not thinking about what she saw. And of course, you can imagine that the mystery of that artifact and the mystery of these people are going to find a way to cross. And Joe Conjol said it's chilling, and it was chilling yes. indeed. Um, Marjorie Deering had made a comment earlier, which we didn't get to. <clears throat> it says, my book, The Horror Within, was just released in audiobook format. It was uh, narrated by Al Pagano a New York born stage and screen actor. He's wonderful. Can't imagine AI could begin to infuse the words on the page with the same emotional input he achieved. That's exactly what I think, Marjorie. That's exactly, that's exactly right. <laughs> Robert White said to quote the poster behind Rob and Joan, I want to believe. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. We are running a little short on time. We've got to get to our second uh, sponsor break here. And then when we come back, we'll have a book giveaway and tell everybody how to find you. How about that? So get ready to get the book, yeah, you guys, Yeah. because it so sounds amazing. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Don't go away. The clock is ticking. Can Gracie uncover the truth? Philip Pliant is the wealthy opportunist plastics dealer and CEO of Pliant Industries. He's also a master thief, creating a pervasive threat to the manufacturing infrastructure in the Caribbean islands markets. With the cartel as his stealth client, the naive city leaders have been seduced, enabling the production of more than three-dimensional building materials. The expected profits are monstrous. Is the R Group, now led by Gracie and the family heirs, strong enough to win against this predator? Can JJ's cats act on the root cause analysis in time? Will Gracie be able to squash Pliant and the cartels? Gracie never considered their lives would hang in the balance. The clock is ticking. Five, four, three. It's 1919, and Eric Laska returns from the war in Europe. Two new enemies await him in the small, coal-mining town he calls home. One is a threat to his relationship with Rebecca, the love of his life. The other a bloodthirsty beast is stalking the mining town residents. The townspeople suspect Eric of one of the killings. An old man and Rebecca's 11-year-old sister have seen the beast, but only Eric believes their story. To protect the town and clear his name, he's forced to prove the werewolf exists. Available on Amazon. The Horror Within by Marjorie Swift Doring. By George Dismukes that will take you deep into the jungle and capture your imagination until the last word. Two Faces of the Jaguar is book one of a trilogy. Two Faces of the Jaguar, where only the adventurous dare to read. Two Faces of the Jaguar, The Lost City, and The Jaguar's Quest are available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Two Faces of the Jaguar, the book people are talking about. Get your copy today.
And we're back. We are, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. That okay. was a really fun reading. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, that was really good. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun to read. Even though I got the word sorrel sort of stuck, but it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I it's guess my heart was pounding too much. <laughs> Even go. when we read our own books, right? It, we still mispronounced yeah. it. You Just, did a real good job. You did a good, really good job. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You brought us into it for sure. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yep. I could see it. I was well, I like to play with that. I know we have to get going, but I like to play with beauty and uh, uh, this kind of a bucolic setting. And then suddenly there's danger because I, I like to kind of kind of get jar jar things. What looks like a gorgeous day. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we used to live in upstate New York, so we're familiar with that. The scenery. Well, Ithaca, <laughs> Ithaca, is, uh, you know, yeah. Oswego, New York are not that far away. And you guys are oh. here. Think Finger we're Lakes right. region. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there you go. Yep. Okay. Well, here's uh, her website, Patricia's website, Trisha. I should call you how you want to be called. You can call me whatever you like. <laughs> Just for dinner, right? <clears throat> okay. Her website is faithhopeandfiction.com. I'll go ahead and spell this for everyone who's listening and not able to watch the podcast. But I'm sure you all know how to spell this. It's F-A-I-T-H-H-O-P-E-A-N-D-F-I-C-T-I-O-N. So that's the website. You can go to the website. You can find all of her information, all of the places you can find her on social media. You know, and I'm sure you even update people on what's new and what's coming up and all that kind of thing, right? Yeah, and it's an e-literary magazine. You can read some short stories. You can submit some short stories. Yes. I mean, all awesome. kinds of things. Yeah. You want to give her email? Yeah. Uh, Trisha's email is trisha at faithhopeandfiction.com. So that's pretty easy to, to reach her there. And the book giveaway tonight is the one you Wait just... a minute. Let's spell Trisha because that is spelled different oh, by is. different people. It is. Even it's our daughter does. Our daughter spells <laughs> differently, yeah. It's T R I C I A. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. But I just want to make sure they could reach her. Not the FBI, it's the CIA. Okay. <laughs> now, That's uh, right. the, book, the book giveaway is the first three people to email Trisha at faithhopeandfiction.com will win an ebook copy of The Secrets of Still Waters Chasm, which is what she just which read is what from. She just read from. And you'll and, find out about all those bodies lying around in this beautiful scene, and then right. they're gone. Yeah. You can, you know, uh, on our website, you can find out how to get the first book, too. So you can be right all right. up. You can figure it all out. Yeah. I'd it's love to hear from folks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can read the first book and figure out how the romance started that we walk in on on this book. So we have about five minutes. Uh, would you like to tell us? what's on the drawing board if there's anything absolutely happening. you know gabriella isn't done yet and um so i'm very excited about having my third novel you know underway uh continuing this story and looking mining more history in in the onita harbor area that's my that's my goal what what is do you have a working title of i do it's called the secrets of the old post cemetery because in my hometown there is a fort that goes back to 1726 and was rebuilt in the early 1800s and there is an old post cemetery where these very modest little grave markers that's unknown soldier 1776 oh my goodness and i was like okay this is asking for something so I play with time a little bit. It's got a historic uh, prologue and epilogue and then a modern story in between. And of course, an artifact um, that Gabriella, the authenticator, uh, busies her mind trying to figure out what this is and where it belongs as she stumbles inevitably into danger and mayhem and chaos and has to find the courage to uh, stand up for what she believes in, protect those she loves and get herself out of the crosshairs. That she does a lot of that. Good. That sounds really good. I love that cemetery. Yeah, yes. I've good. always loved it. And one of the favorite characters in books one, two, and three is her 77-year-old Italian-born mo mother, Agnese. And Agnese is the one who just gives her the business all the time. She's a bit of comedic relief, but it, I love this 
the fact that it's a multi-generational story as well between a secondary character, her mother. I can hear Agnese saying, what do you mean secondary? I'm the big character. <laughs> we just don't tell Agnese that. So that's another thing that I really like in storytelling is they have families. My characters, you know, have texture. They've got context. The people they are is revealed in uh, in their interactions with others. Gabriella, single mom, Gabriella, her mother's daughter, Gabriella in a relationship with Daniel and also a community leader because she's the executive director of the library. So excellent. That's all these hats. What do you think? Do you think it'll continue after book three or do you think you're going to be, how are you feeling? Do you feel like you oh, told? Oh, I'm not done. You know, I, I, I'm not done. I think, and Gabriella isn't, I, I'd love to do a Christmas mystery. I think this town and all that snow and all the quirky characters, it'd be really fun to do a Christmas mystery in this series. So that's, that's my, good. That's, uh, that's good. You may have said it and I may have missed it. Uh, when is book three mm, possibly going to be coming out? You know, I would hope that the end of 2024, you know, we, you know, we, okay. we they tend to come out at the end of year. So that's that would be my hope. Okay. All right. So maybe next fall, early we'll winter. We'll keep on talking again next fall. You know, that's there you fine. Go. Look at an <laughs> annual event. <laughs> right. There you go. Actually, for some of our authors, it has been it, an annual yeah, event. Yeah, sure has. Sure has. Yeah. Okay. Well, is yeah. there anything else you'd like to speak about, Trish? You know, no. I think that, you know, I, there's a couple things that are near and dear to my heart. Number one is, and I know that I can just tell by the comments being uh, being asked and those fabulous commercials, I'm riveted, is that, you know, we're all pursuing our dream and we don't accept other people's no. Uh, it's not no, it's just not yet, or it's almost or different direction. And we keep our dreams alive and we keep our uh, writing ambitions alive. And we let those stories take us to different places. You know, that's the best adventure we can give ourselves are the stories we write. And when we love them, there's a good chance other people will love them. That's number one. That's the thing I love what we all do, right? Right. So um, I allow myself to be surprised. I allow myself to, um, I love research. There's a lot of research for me in my books because there is an artifact and there is this history. I play with history, but it has to be factually based. People who really were in upstate New York at the time and discovering um, weird facts and quirky things and how something could be plausible just brings it alive for me in such a, a, a fascinating way. And I mean, what better way to spend my alleged free time? But <laughs> I think that pulls at us, mysteries pull at us because they help us to find our way through complex problems. So when the world feels uncertain or maybe life is, uh, is challenging, mysteries are a good escape, but there's something else besides escape. They engage that problem solving. We see dot to dot to dot to solution. And I think that's an exercise for what we can do in our own lives to say, I'm stuck or I can't figure this out or whatever. And we see dot to dot to dot to solution for ourselves. So read a mystery, get your critical thinking going, and it'll make your life better too. There you go. Robert White says 50 ways to slay in New York City or Oswego or, you know, our made up town. No <laughs> need to have harbor our book title. Yeah. Thanks, Hopefully Robert. That was Great book title. <laughs> it was a book title. <laughs> he was just throwing it out there. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, oh, tonight. my pleasure. And thank look you. Look forward to hopefully next year doing the same thing. This was really fun. Yeah. Really enjoyed yeah. it a lot. I'm sure the audience did so as well. Fun. So, going to move you over and hang on there. And we're going to close out here. Um, I think we have another. Joe says, great show tonight. Thanks to Tricia, who is a bundle of energy. And of course, Joan, <laughs> thank you, Joe, for tuning in. Paul Hollis says, another wonderful, informative show. Thanks, Rob, Joan, and Tricia. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, audience. Yeah, The show sure. wouldn't be the same without you, Tricia, or without the audience. It'd just be Rob and I talking. And, and nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants yeah. to see that. So next week, 
uh, join us uh, same Wait a time, minute, same one place. More. Marjorie Deering. And may I say that the um, voiceover actor did make a little mistake on Marjorie's book. She, he calls her Marjorie Doring, but her name is indeed Marjorie Deering. <laughs> Thanks for another terrific episode, Rob, Joan, and Tricia. Thank you, Marjorie. And thank you, George. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow night, Marjorie. It's going to be fun because some crazy things happen. Yeah. George Dismuke sure. says, great interview. Okay. So I want to also tell the uh, people in other countries that are listening to this podcast, um, we'd like to kind of hear from you. From you. So give us a give us an email at carternovels at AOL.com and uh, tell us your story. What, what are you there for? You know, where are you? And how you like the show and all that. Mm -hmm. And Joy Shelton York says, great show. Thank Thanks, you, Joy. Joe. Marjorie Daring says, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, Marjorie, because it's really going to be fun. <laughs> oh, William Nelson said, I enjoyed this. I will be a regular. That's Super. great, Bill. Glad to have yeah, you, Yeah, tune in next well, week. Same time, same more. channel. <laughs> tune in to the Paranormal Show, the same channel. Well, yeah. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um Right now, uh, I want to remind everybody to tune in to Voice of Indy podcast uh, right after this show. And here's a little outro to uh, tell you how to get there. On how to get there. <laughs> so until next time. That's all, folks. Night. Live every Wednesday, your Voice of Indie hosts, Beam Weeks and Stephen G's, welcome authors, musicians, publishing industry pros, artists, and assorted creative guests for an exciting interactive hour. Call in during the show or post questions and comments on Twitter for responses in real time. Meet your favorite indie creators, learn inside tips, network, and promote your work. The link for each week's show is pinned on Twitter atop at Voice of Indie. And you can receive the link every Wednesday morning in your inbox by subscribing to our newsletter at freshinkgroup.com. Check out Voice of Indie every Wednesday on Blog Talk Radio and catch hundreds of episodes archived everywhere from our websites to our YouTube channel and Spotify. Thank you for joining us here on Meet the Author. Make sure you stay up to date with our show by clicking like, follow, and share. And you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and more. See you next time on WLFE-DV.com. You've been listening to WLFE-DV.com, where our shows are your shows.